हेलो गुड टू गो ओके थैंक यू सर सो विथ ऑल यू परमिशन आई एम स्टार्टिंग द सेशन good evening and a warm welcome to all the dignitaries present here myself rupsha from clarinet assigned as a session assistant to ensure a seamless experience clarinet stands as india's most relied upon digital platform offering a multitude of enriching services exclusively for doctors it is with great pride that clarinet is a digital partner of this event organized by indian association of preventive and social medicine karnataka chapter and the topic of today's session is designing and validation of questionnaire So let's begin today's session. For which I would like to invite Dr. Animesh Jain, sir. Over to you, sir. Kindly proceed with your talk. Thank you, Rupsa. So, hello, everyone, and good evening. If you are watching from India and if you are outside, so warm greetings to you. Uh, this is what has happened with the the you know digitization post COVID that we have adapted to this, and we are very happy that. we are doing this program every month and this is like reaching out to many people across india and some of them outside india as well so we are very happy and we are again with one more session of iapp that is inter institutional academic post the academic program for post graduate though it was conceived as a program for post graduates initially to start off during pre covid times as a uh, off line program and then it was physical program but with covid times and then we have moved to digital and we have a better reach so what we do is we try to reach out to different people take up very important issues we last time we took about uh, how to design a cv and then how to you know improve your cv before that we had on statistics and we've done multiple things so this time we are again here with another very interesting and very important topic that is designing and validation of questionnaire and this is under the aegis of iaps and karnataka state so we have the president of iaps in karnataka dr poonam with us i hand over to dr poonam for her opening remarks and then i'll proceed further with moderating so dr poonam please thank you dr animesh uh, and thank you clarinet team uh, yes uh, so it's a pleasure to host uh, to have this uh, another uh, one more important academic activity under iaps in karnataka chapter and uh, as uh, dr animesh uh, mentioned with covid and online digital uh, platforms and with the support from clarinet team our uh, objective of uh, reaching out to a larger audience for the import for the benefit of all with such important topics of academic importance and research importance we are able to reach out to a larger audience and uh, that makes uh, our objective uh, getting realized so we hope we are able to do justice uh, to the important uh, objective of our ips in karnataka state chapter <clears throat> and uh, we all know research is an integral element of uh, community medicine uh, and when it comes to research questionnaire or the data tools are another important component which makes the research valid or it brings out the importance of a research and to get the appropriate results we need to have an appropriate appropriate questionnaire which is collects uh, which which we are able to get quality data capture and not unnecessarily components are being captured and it also needs to be valid so that at the end of the day at the end of the research we are able to have fruitful results as well with the help of the data collection tool that we would have developed so this is a very important topic for uh, those interested in research and i am sure uh, today's topic is of interest not only for those from the field of community medicine but also from other fields and disciplines as well because data collection tool is the first stepping stone for conducting uh, any research let it be a clinical research or let it be an intervention or just a field based study or an epidemiological research for that matter so we look forward uh, to a very fruitful session and happy learning experience for all those assembled over here and i uh, thank dr pravin kulkarni for being the resource person uh, for this session and uh, thank dr animesh for moderating this session thank you and welcome to all and a fruitful learning session to so thank you dr punam for those opening remarks and giving us a little overview of this session uh, let me take you forward so as dr punam said that it's very important to have a right tool and for any study that we do we need to have the right tool and that comes from the questionnaire is a generic term that we are using and i'm sure dr pravin will take you through and then tell you more about it however 
please understand that if we ask the right questions, then only we will get the right answers and we will get the right data. And that's the basis for any good research. So I think that's very important. And he's going to tell you about the nuances of building a good questioner and also about validating it and how to go about creating it. So that's something which is going to be in uh, store for you. Let me briefly introduce Dr. Praveen to you. Dr. Praveen has been a dear and good friend of mine. We've worked together in multiple things. And currently he's a professor of community medicine and is also uh, having an administrative responsibility that is as a vice principal of JSS Medical College a couple of months back, he assumed that charge. And uh, uh, he's from JSS Medical College, which is a deemed university itself, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research at Mysore. And Dr. Praveen has also been a famous fellow and, and I've known him very closely during that time. If I remember correctly, I may be wrong. 2016 was his batch of famous fellowship probably, but Dr. Praveen can uh, correct me. But other than that, he's also been into many other things and just notable, I think if I remember again, he's done leadership training and because Dr. Praveen hasn't uh, provided me the bio data, so I'm just telling you what I know about him. And we've been instrumental in, in a capacity building initiative during the COVID times, during the pandemic, when there was a lockdown. So this was about a four month long series of uh, uh, program, which helped in training 200 faculty across India in CBME related uh, issues. So this was a very intensive program with twice a week things with assignments. So Dr. Praveen was very actively engaged and involved as a faculty. So we did that. And there are quite a few other things, including some of these uh, research where clinical trials and vaccine uh, trial for COVID vaccine and all that has been also part of his uh, portfolio, which he's done. So very active researcher, very enthusiastic person, very, very, uh, you know, down to earth and very humble and, and easy to mix with and always eager to learn. So with that uh, very brief introduction, let me hand over to Dr. Praveen, who will take us through this session. And I request all of you to keep your questions uh, ready, or if you want, you can post it in the chat. We will take all the questions at the end. So over to you, Praveen. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, very good evening to one and all. And uh, thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. I am really humbled. So always uh, the dream of the student is to know what mentor will talk about him. So as you are my mentor, I always love to know what what is in the heart of mentor about uh, the mentee. Uh, thank you very much, IAPSM Karnataka State Chapter, for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my ideas, my knowledge uh, related to uh, designing and validation of the questionnaire. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Poonam, uh, ma'am, as well as Animesh, sir, already mentioned, the community medicine and as a health researcher, we need to develop the questionnaires and we need to use the questionnaires in a more effective manner. When it comes to the health researchers in academic institutions, we need to have larger competency in designing and validating the questionnaire because we are not only using it for our own studies, but we are going to validate the questionnaire for other studies also. Considering that, I thought this topic would be of great interest for the academicians and for the student uh, of, of the postgraduate students who are all working in various fields of health research across the country. With this very brief note, let me start on this particular topic of designing and validation of questionnaire. A famous saying is that the art and science of asking questions is a source of all knowledge. And we, the community medicine people and of experts are always fond of asking questions and making comparisons. These are the two basic core competencies with which the epidemiology and the public health works across the world. And apart from that, any other specialty, science is all about asking questions. And we do not believe anything blindly. We check, cross-check, and check for the validity of that information. And then only we accept it. Considering that, asking questions is a very, very important and pertinent aspect of science. In that way, asking right questions of right spirit at right time to the right person is also a very important component, which we are going to learn through the questionnaire designing aspects. In this session, we are going to list various tools for data collection, 
Describe the steps in designing a questionnaire. List various methods of validating the questionnaire and reflect on various advantages and disadvantages of questionnaire as a tool for data collection. When we come into the medical research, we have different tools for data collection. It starts with questionnaire, interview schedule, observation schedule, scales, tests, inventories, checklists, and sociograms, sociometry, opinionaires. These are various tools we use for data collection. And most of the time when uh, beginners and to some extent when people start working with a questionnaires, they use many of these terms interchangeably, which is not correct. We need to be very specific on what we are using. In this particular session, I'm restricting myself to the designing of the questionnaire. And later on, we will be seeing in some other sessions over a period of time, we may understand various other methods of, I mean, uh, uh, designing various other tools for data collection. When you want to use or when you, when you want to design a particular questionnaire, hold on, think for a while. Is questionnaire the only best method to collect the information? If answer to this is yes, then go ahead with designing and using the questionnaire. And when you decide that questionnaire is the best way of collecting the data for this particular study, check whether there are already available questionnaires in the literature. There may be many people who would have done study in the similar uh, construct you are going to uh, do the study and check whether there are already existing questionnaires. If there are already existing questionnaires, check number one, whether the questionnaire matches with the purpose of your study. This is most important. Whether it is it matches with the aim of your study, your objectives. And second thing, is it validated? And used in our country in similar settings, you need to check about it. And most important thing is, once you use a questionnaire, whether there is a guide for analysis available or not. For example, when we use scales, there they need to be cut off. For example, we are using a scale on anxiety, you know, uh, anxiety related eating. We call it as emotional eating. And when we ask a set of questions, we need to check what with what score a person is considered to have emotional eating behavior. And when we do not have this cutoff, when we do not have this particular analysis guide for a particular questionnaire, then our whole process will go into when I'll tell you one example. One of the student has conducted the study and used the questionnaire, collected the data from 1000 subjects. And when he came for analysis, he got to know that there is no analysis guide. The cutoff points are not there. And how to analyze this data? This becomes a huge task for first finding out what is a cutoff that determines a particular outcome. And hence the whole exercise had to go in vain. Considering that we need to know first when you decide to use any questionnaire or a scale, find out whether there is an analysis guide for that or not. If it is there, then you can attempt using it. And people bring some questionnaire and they say, I want to use this questionnaire. And we when we check it, when we check the individual questions in that particular questionnaire, they are far away from understanding of our communities. People do not easily understand those questions. There may be complicated questions, there may be technical jargons or something which is not very commonly related to our sociocultural milieu. At that point in time, it becomes difficult for us to accept that questionnaire and, and the responses you are going to get are not going to be valid. And finally, you need to think whether this questionnaire requires translation or not. Sometimes translated questionnaires are also available in the local language. For example, patient health questionnaire, which is a questionnaire to assess depression. There is a, there, there are, I mean, various Indian language questionnaires 
are also available of PHQ-9, which are translated and linguistically validated. That's the reason. First, think about these four or five questions. And when you are really convinced, discuss with your mentor, your friends, your teachers, then decide on whether you really want to go for questionnaire. Questionnaires help us to obtain four basic informations. Number one, they help in identifying what people know. We call it as knowledge. And what they think or feel, we call it as belief, attitude, or opinions. And what people do, we call it as behavior. And what characteristics people have, what factors influence the occurrence of a particular event. These four questions are basically answered by our questionnaires. Okay. Single or in combination, these four components are incorporated in the questionnaire and we are going to utilize them for collecting the data. I'll be using most of these terms very commonly. Please concentrate on this particular slide. This gives us an idea about what are different parts of a questionnaire. Okay. So in any questionnaire, there will be a construct. What is a construct? Construct is the outcome of your study. What you want to assess. What is your final one line outcome that you want to assess or you want to understand from your study. Construct could be depression. It could be knowledge. It could be attitude or it could be practice or it could be altogether knowledge, attitude, practice or it could be the perception about a first aid, or it could be anything. What you want to measure at the end of your study is something what we call as a construct. You need to first identify what is a construct. And that should be initially be a part of your questionnaire. It should be very well reflected in your questionnaire. Number two. Individual questions in the questionnaire are called as items, okay? Individual questionnaires in the question, individual questions in a particular questionnaire are called as items. People ask 23 item questionnaire, 40 item questionnaire. It means that there are 40 questions in that particular questionnaire. And all the items put together is called as a content, Okay, so that is a content of your questionnaire. How many questions are there? All the items put together is called as a content of the questionnaire. And then there will be multiple options for the question for the participants to respond. They are called as options. And there can be anchors also. Anchors are the first row items which are going to guide the respondent to respond. They are called as anchors okay these these are by and large different parts of this is uh, i can easily put it as anatomy of a questionnaire so anatomy of questionnaire looks like this okay and when you want to develop the questionnaire first thing you need to do is decide on what you want to get out of your questionnaire what is your construct what is your final end point? What is a concept of your study? Whether you want to es estimate the depression, whether you want to estimate anxiety, suicidal tenden tendency, or you want to estimate the knowledge, attitude, practice, prevalence, in you know, whatever. That will be the construct of your study. In the, in the questionnaire I showed, it is depression. That is a construct of the study. First, decide on what is the construct of your study. Then, you decide on the steps in designing the questionnaire. I'm going to use, I'm going to describe the six steps approach in designing questionnaire which is most commonly accepted method of questionnaire designing in educational research. And as most of our research is related to the social science research, we 
can rely on the six steps approach of designing the questionnaire. The first step in designing the questionnaire is thorough review of literature. Do a proper re review of literature. One hint I can give you to decide on your items of questionnaire in review of literature because many of your postgraduate students <coughs> look at the tables in the papers. They are going to give you idea about what variables other studies have assessed. And those variables will give you the hint for developing the items or questions. And read the result part completely so that it will give you an idea about what others have done. And most importantly, again, I am stressing, you need to look at the table component of paper for deciding on your items or deciding on your questions or variables. When you do this review of literature, we will also get to know about whether there are already existing questionnaires or scales. So that will avoid your repetition. Okay. So uh, you may be wanting to do a study on quality of life. Quality of life among diabetics, quality of life among people with chronic illnesses. When you are doing a review of literature, you find out a study where they have used a standardized questionnaire that will give you an idea about utilizing that kind of a questionnaire, which is validated for your study. And it will also give the review of literature will also give you an idea about framing the items in your questionnaire. So what as, as a student, what I used to do is and as a uh, researcher also what I do and I teach my students is when you look into the literature papers, look into the tables, write down what all things they have assessed in different, different papers. Okay. And this exhaustive list is there with you. And that gives you an idea about preparing a draft questionnaire. And after this, you need to talk to the people. And ultimate end users or ultimate people who are going to provide you the information are the people. Okay. First, you just talk to the people in the community. You can have some group discussions or formal, informal discussions. You will get an idea about what is a prevailing practice in the community. I will give you one example in one during my post graduation, uh, you know, uh, I was doing a study on knowledge, attitude and practice related to rabies. And when we looked into the practices, first aid practices, people do after a person is bitten by the animal in our literature. We found people apply, you know, people wash the wound, they apply lime, they apply uh, you know, jaggery, they apply coffee powder, tea powder, turmeric powder, chili powder, whatnot. And we made an exhaustive list of what will you do after you are bitten by the dog. We had a list of things. I apply lime, I apply mud, I apply cow dung, I apply chili powder, this powder, that powder. And when uh, we went to the community and we discussed with the people there, what, what do you actually do when you are bitten by the dog or when somebody is bitten by the dog in your uh, vicinity, in your locality? We got a very interesting answer, which was not existing in any of the literatures. The people there in the vicinity of Bangalore, people used to apply jackfruit gum with copper coin. Okay, I repeat. If a person is bitten by the dog, have you all seen jackfruit? You might have seen the jackfruit, right? People in South India will definitely see the jackfruit. Jackfruit will be having a very gummy, gummy uh, pulp inside. So once a person is bitten by the dog, they apply that jackfruit gum. And on that, they put a copper coin. There will be some sort of a reaction that takes place, place between the jackfruit gum and the copper coin. And the copper coin turns green. If something turns green, a common perception is that it has absorbed the poison. And they think that it's done. So there is no need to go for further treatment. This kind of thing, this kind of practice was not documented in many of the papers, except that came out of our institution. So when, when we interviewed people, we got to know that this is a very prevalent practice. And we incorporated it in our questionnaire. 
imagine if you would have not spoken to people we would have missed this very prevalent behavior which is going to which gives us a hint for behavior change intervention in future considering that we need to be very careful when we talk to the people we get ample of information which is not existing in the literature so what we did first we first listed all the items all the variables that were there in the previous papers through looking at the results as well as our table section and then we talk to the people and we find out what is their practice or what actually they feel they do they understand then put your theoretical aspects that you get from your papers and the reality together and then decide what questions i need to frame okay this gives us a comprehensive view okay what is existing in the literature and what you got from the community you put together put both the intellectual components together and start designing your questionnaire start developing your items so you need to put both of them together and start developing the questionnaires i want to spend more time on this step because this is the most important step if you ask me what is the heart of designing questionnaire this is the heart of designing questionnaire okay developing the items developing the questions okay so always ensure that the questions are very clear comprehensible understandable in a very simple manner understandable to whom to the one whom you ask this question and they are written in concordance with in con in accordance with the current best practices okay next there can be two types of items two types of questions that we think i am not talking about the questionnaire i am talking about an item a particular question a particular question can be a closed ended question okay where you give a question and a set of responses and these responses are closed okay so five responses you are going to give and the participant has to tick one among these five only okay so what happens with this is sometime people have something else in their mind compared to what is there in your options then they become they they will not have an option to respond let me go to this particular question itself when we went with a closed uh, you know ended question we got these are the five responses and when we just keep it open okay one new component is added like for example others specify we got very interesting responses here rabies is transmitted by mosquitoes rabies is transmitted by rat rabies is transmitted by birds these kind of responses we got which are very important for you to give your awareness to the people that rabies is not transmitted by these components okay these uh, animals so it is always democratic to have one open option in a particular questionnaire structured but open ended your questionnaire will be your item is structured because there is a question and there are set of responses and after that there is an option for others okay so if the person if the respondent thinks that apart from these five options listed over here there are some other options also they can easily write there it can be completely open ended so there is no resp options at all you ask the questions and the participants will respond sometimes this becomes too difficult for analysis everyone will try to give their own responses and consolidating them will be very difficult so we usually avoid completely open ended questionnaires but when you have a qualitative component also where you need to really want want to know what people feel about a particular uh, i you know construct then you go for this open ended questionnaire i i want to give some tips for you for 
writing the items or questions. First, I have already told, keep your language very simple and comprehending. Person, when he reads the question, he should understand it. Don't use a technical jargons. And use a local language as much as possible. And when you are doing your focus group discussions, when you are interacting with the people, they'll give you what is the most prevalent or commonly used language for that particular construct in, in, the, in the area. Try to use that particular thing as a hint when you are designing the questionnaire. Okay. Keep it very simple. Keep it understandable. And keep it short and sweet. Should, you, usually people come with a voluminous questionnaire. Uh, Dr. Poonam, Madam was making a mention at the beginning. Sub, sub kuch leke ao, baad mein dekhenge what we are going to do. Get as much information as possible. That becomes too tedious. So people will not respond. And sometimes questions are so big that people, by the time they read the whole question, they get exhausted. That's the reason keep the questionnaire questions very simple, straightforward and in one sentence. And if you use lengthy questions, lengthy questionnaires, so uh, it is going to take out the people's time and they get distracted and they get exhausted and they are not going to respond to that questionnaire anywhere. And rest of the responses after that lengthy question are going to become less effective they are not going to the responses are not going to be of great use to you okay? and most importantly the questions need to be usually insufficient quantity to meet the objectives of your study okay and always ask one question at a time okay so just look at this example. How often do you feel anxious while reading pharmacology and microbiology? So uh, I, I love pharmacology. I like it. And I do not get anxious when I'm reading pharmacology. But on the other hand, I get more anxious when I'm reading microbiology. So when I have to answer to this question, do I need to answer for pharmacology or microbiology? So you need to be very specific. You split this question. How often you feel when you are reading anxious, when you are reading pharmacology and how often you feel anxious when you are reading microbiology. These kind of questions are called as double barreled questions where the participant, the respondent gets confused to which component I need to answer. I was giving you an example of double parallel question, exactly the same as what I told to you. How often do you feel panic while taking exams and answering questions? I am a very good writer. I write 10 mark essay, four pages, and I'm I'm very fast writer. I don't feel anxious when I'm writing the exam. And but when it comes to responding to the viva. Oh, I start getting palpitations. I get sweating, tremors. So I become really anxious. When this question is asked, I get confused whether I need to respond for Viva or to the theory. That's the reason. Avoid asking double barrel questionnaire. When you have a questionnaire, sit with it and see what kind of responses you may get. Whether there is a double, you know, barreled questions of this sort. Okay, so in, if there are a double uh, barrel questions, if there is an anticipation, split them into two or three different questions, which are going to you know help you in understanding it. Next, avoid negative. Some people are fond of asking negative questions. You look at the questions there. There are many negative. Don't you wash your hands after attending the patients? What per what participant has to respond? You are starting your question with the negative. It is better to start. Do you wash hands after attending the patients? Yes or no? This negative questions will create a kind of a bias in answering the questions. Sometimes people are so fond of negatives, they do double negatives. Don't you think syllabus is not a cause of your anxiety? First of all, I take time in understanding this question. What is this question about? 
it becomes too difficult to understand uh, don't not two two negatives if i first go with the first negative and cancel second negative i'll cancel second negative and cancel first negative confusion and when the respondent think yourself in the put yourself in the shoes of a respondent what is their mental status at the time of responding to your questions so then it becomes very difficult putting their you know whole time and their energy in understanding one question rest of the questions will go completely you know unanswered next is attach a frame to the questionnaire frame could be a time frame how often were you not able to sleep sleep due to anxiety associated with your studies if i ask this question one year back six years six months back one month back during exams during family functions when i get confused when i have to respond to this question so if i am given a time frame for example in last 15 days how often you felt you were not able to sleep due to anxiety related to your studies then fine in last 15 days i know in last 15 days i can easily recall and then give the response to my question so considering that always give a time frame attach a time frame to your question so that it becomes more valid now you designed your questionnaire now you have a draft questionnaire in your hand so what is the first step first step you did a thorough review of literature you listed down the questions i variables and then in the next step you went with the community interviews you went with the community interviews and you try to find out what community feels about a particular issue in third step you consolidated both both of them and you started thinking of designing your questions and in fourth step you designed your questions you have drafted your items and after you have drafted your items the first fifth thing is show it to the expert the expert will look into it and they will give you an idea about whether the questions drafted by you are in line with current scientific knowledge that is most important because experts have lots of experience they might have done studies with n number of students and they might have seen n number of questionnaires read through you give it to the experts and tell them sir please go through the questionnaire and give your feedback take the time it it is it is very important when you give your questionnaire to the expert you need to really give time to them to read through the questionnaire and respond back to you and you need to give them multiple reminders after a particular period of time sometimes phd scholars come to me come to many in my place and give the questionnaires go i forget they forget it's done but nowadays they have become very intelligent they keep coming multiple times did you go through did you go through okay fine now i have got that as a part of my uh, agenda i need to go and do it off so always show it to the experts preliminarily so that will give you an idea this this component is also called as a face validity about which i am going to talk a bit later okay so always when you give to the experts experts may give this opinion this what dr punam madam was making it a mention at the morning le lo get anxiety get depression get academic performance get obesity get anthropometry get everything and then we will decide what we are going to put in our study this is very wrong first decide on what you want to collect and you are going to take ethics committee clearance for this for your study okay you take ethics ethical clearance for anxiety you collect obesity also you collect academic performance also you have not taken ec approval for those components okay so whatever is your primary and secondary objective of your study which you have submitted to the ethics committee and is a part of your synopsis collect data related only to that 
Okay, don't get everything. I can write five papers out of it because I collect data of five different five study worth. You will not write one paper also. I I I I can assure you about it. So be very focused and specific in collecting the data. Now you go for expert validation. Experts will go through it and then your questionnaire is ready. They'll say few questions can be modified, rewritten, reframed, removed, repetition. Many such responses will come from experts. They say question number, these two questions look exactly similar. Can you merge both of them or you put one, keep one among them? And uh, some ex you know experts may say this questionnaire is not question is not very much appealing. It's not very understandable. You can reframe it. You can restructure this question so you can do accordingly. Okay, based on the feasibility. And after all this, the last step is last but one step. But according to the uh, framework of six steps approach, this is the last step go for cognitive interviews. Cognitive interviews in other way can be utilized as your pilot studies also. Now your questionnaire is ready. Go to 10 different people. They should be similar to the subjects of your data collection, but they should not be the same. For example, you want to uh, do your study in village A, go to village B or village C and conduct this interview among people. And ask the questions to the people. Look at their responses. Do they easily understand this question? And they respond to it. Or they are feeling difficulty in understanding this. Or they are feeling this question need to be modified. Or they are not responding to you at all for some questions. Based on that, talk to them. Modify them. These people are going to be gold mines for you. Because they are going to tell you how your questionnaire need to be modified. Okay, and you can do this interview for five to 10 members and then you can modify your questionnaire accordingly and you can use them. Okay, this cognitive interviews are the most important component of the finalization step of your questionnaire. Okay, so cognitive interview is nothing but the questionnaire is developed. You, to you take it and pilot it among five to 10 people. Your objective here is not to collect the data. Your objective here, here is to check whether people are understanding your questions or not, whether they are comprehending, whether your questions are in sequence or not, whether they are matching with the objectives of your study or not. So these components you can assess in the cognitive interviews. And based on that, you can modify the questions and then you can use them. And the last step, which is not there in those uh, conventional six steps, but this is the most important component that is pilot testing that you do as a part of your cognitive interviews also, but you can do the study on a small set of participants, small set of individuals who are more or less same as that of your study sample. I'll give you an example. Sometimes people, what people do is uh, we give uh, this questionnaire, you do pilot testing of this questionnaire. They go to the classmates and their batchmates, maybe a students or PGs. They give the questionnaire to them and they respond to it and say, sir, I have pilots tested this particular questionnaire. And when we ask them, who are your study participants? They say, villagers, general community. Achha, you want to do study in general community whose knowledge, whose level of thinking is completely different from your MBBS friend or your MD or MS friend. So doing pilot study in non-representative sample is as good as not doing the pilot study at all. Okay. So the pilot study has to be conducted on the individuals who are representative of your final study subjects. And you need to go to the similar locality where you conduct your pilot study. It gives you an idea about the responders and non-responders it will give you an idea about the comprehension of the questions and cooperation by the people and gives you idea about the response rate. Because if you have a too lengthy 120 items questionnaire, you go and do a pilot testing. Among 10 people you interview, only two responded, eight did not respond. Then you get to know that my questionnaire is very lengthy. I need to change it.
अच्छा इट गिव्स यू एन आइडिया अबाउट रेस्पॉन्स रेट एंड इट ऑल्सो गिव्स यू इफ यू आर गिविंग अ सेल्फ एडमिनिस्ट्रेड क्वेश्चन आर वेर पीपल देम सेल्स आर गोइंग टू रेस्पॉन्ड टू इट एट दैट पॉइंट इन टाइम इट गिव्स यू एन आइडिया अबाउट द कंप्लीशन रेट ऑल्सो टू वॉट एक्सटेंड पीपल people are completing the questionnaire fully <laughs> and it, it it is a last chance for you to change okay after this the questionnaire is ready and then you are going to use it for your study okay so this is a last chance for making the study and pilot studies also give us an idea about assessing the validity and reliability of the questionnaires or the scales these are the six steps approach and with the seven step let us call now it as a seven step approach in designing the questionnaires let me repeat the steps for your benefit number 1 thorough review of literature number 2 doing focus group discussions or interacting with the community third amalgamating information from theory and the you know uh, interviews in the community fourth developing the items or your questions then showing it to the experts and after that doing cognitive interviews and finally pilot testing these are the seven steps in designing a particular questionnaire now we will go to the next part of questionnaire how we actually put it on paper and how we are going to use it i was talking to you about individual items okay individual items where you will be having a closed ended item and open ended item something like that so now we have types of questionnaires type of questionnaires can be structured questionnaires where you have 15 questions and all 15 questions are closed ended questions okay you call it as completely structured questionnaire and second is unstructured questionnaire where all questions are open ended questions and there is no sequence between the questions it is just as informal as informal discussion or informal interviews next is semi structured questionnaires this is most desirable method of data collection desirable type of questions there are mix of open ended and closed ended items and there is always an additional space to respond to the views of the participant and this gives you a rich amount of information okay so uh, we were doing a study on uh, uh, say uh, uh, depression among adolescent school children we collected data from say around around 7000 school children adolescents and we left a space after phq 9 questionnaire we left a space you express your views some students have written those who are having depression something which you do not get in your questionnaire i am depressed because i want to express something which is not there in any of your questions in your scale there is always a fight at my family my parents every day fight and they do not give time to me and i feel like do not exist to them and i want to come if this continues i feel like ending my life see this is such an important chunk of information which we get when we leave additional space to the people sometime you get something completely unrelated also but sometime you get a very very solid information there okay so leave some space for providing additional information most commonly used are semi structured questionnaire so there is some difference between a questionnaire and schedule okay the questionnaires are the tools of data collection where the the responses are filled by the you know respondents you give a questionnaire the self administered questionnaire in other ways commonly observed as self administered questionnaire you give questionnaire to the people and they will respond to individual questions but the schedule is different we call it as interview schedule in interview schedule you have formalized set of questions where you ask the question to the people and you will be getting the response from them always the interview schedules okay are more 
are going to provide more richer and more, and more authentic information okay schedules are the ones where there will be an interaction between the respondent and the researcher there will be you are asking the question and they are responding but in questionnaire typical questionnaires you are going to give the questionnaire to them and they will respond to it you will collect back check for completeness and then you are going to use it there are different uh, you know, rating scales also available so there is something called likert scale there is something called gutman scale Thurston scale and semantic differential scale. So uh, it will be very difficult to go through each of these components. Uh, I will be just introducing you to these concepts and then move further. Likert scale is one of a very commonly used scale for assessing the attitudes, opinions, perceptions of the people. So it could be a three you know, uh, there can it may be three point Likert scale or a four point Likert scale or a five point Likert scale. It's starting from strongly disagree to agree, strongly agree to disagree, or it could be very dissatisfied to very satisfied. Always, you know, go in a sequence of responses. Some people go for a four point Likert scale. And some people go for a five-point Likert scale. And some people go for seven-point Likert scale. So it depends on the response rate, the, uh, the, uh, the construct of your study, the items, and what could be an array of responses you may get. To what extent you want to allow a sort of uh, variability in the data collection. So you need to keep that thing in your mind when you are deciding on the number of points in the Likert scale. A very commonly used Likert scale has got five points starting from strongly agree to strongly disagree or strongly disagree to strongly agree. Okay, so always remember Likert scale is not the one which has to be used everywhere. People come with a hundred item questionnaire and all of them have got a Likert scale. Okay, so Likert scale people use left and right. Always remember, it is not the only way of assessing it. Okay, and too much of obsession is not required about Likert scale. But definitely Likert scale is going to give you a good amount of information, especially related to components of opinions, components of beliefs, components of attitude, opinions, those kind of things. What's the advantages of this Likert scale? It is easy during self-administered questionnaire because when I get read a statement, I will be able to pick whether I strongly agree, agree, disagree. I can make that distinction and tick accordingly. And it saves a lot of time. And some behavioral components, like for example, quality of life, perception about illness, which are very, very qualitative components, which cannot be measured. But with a Likert scale, you can easily measure them. But there are a lot of disadvantages when you are using it as an interview schedule. Okay, I'll tell you what is a disadvantage. So you ask a question, you make a statement. Statement could be, dengue is preventable. Responses are strongly agree, agree, Neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Person says yes. Then what will you, where will you take it as? Will you take it as strongly agree or agree? He agreed. Rabies is a 100% fatal disease, is your statement. He says yes. He agreed. Where will you take it in your Likert scale? Do you take it at strongly agree or agree? This becomes a question when you are using it as an interview schedule. Okay. So if it is a self-administered questionnaire, he will use his intellectual thinking and they have the psychometric analysis that takes place within the complicated connections in the brain and they will decide. And there is lack of uniformity in understanding and responding to the context of the questionnaire. When you give to the people, 
the response is starting usually when we get a questionnaire, we always think that it starts from strongly agree and ends with strongly disagree. In one of uh, my uh, in in one of the study where I was a participant, the student gave a questionnaire to me, and I imagined that the first is strongly agree and last is strongly disagree. It was my imagination; I had not read it, and I have picked everywhere the first, 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 and sent. And when he looked at it, it, the first was strongly disagree and all were the positive statements. So at that point in time, so it becomes difficult for people, you know, you should give real time. The participant should give real time in understanding the anchors and then respond. And if there are more number of rating questions, learners tend to you know, forget or unfollow the rating pattern. First question, positive. Second question, negative. For first question, strongly agree is your good option. For second question, strongly disagree is your favor favorable option. Then reading this, they get exhausted. So it becomes more difficult. And in same scale, people put uh, first question is seven point Likert scale. Third question is five point Likert scale. Seventh question is, seventh question is three point Likert scale. Then this becomes too difficult for people to understand it. There is something called a semantic differential scale where from one end of responses to the other end of responses, most favorable, most unfavorable, we put at two different extremes and we ask the participant to tick somewhere in that line. Okay, there may be five, six, seven points there and we ask the participant to put a line there. Okay, and put a point there where he actually falls now. And we give an intervention and after the intervention, we ask again to the same person, now you tick yourself where you stand. A person who was less competitive before your intervention may go a bit right side towards competitiveness and he may become more competitive or from other way, they may become less competitive. So something like that. So in, in a linear fashion, at initial stage, you will ask the participant to self assess his own level and after some time after your intervention you give the same question to the person and ask him to check where exactly he lies at the end so this is how the you can do a pre and post assessment of change in the behavior there is something called as Gutman scale. This Gutman scale is something, again, it's a very, uh, it, it's a bit complicated issue to discuss over here. For example, you give a particular theme, for example, physical exercise using the junk food. There are series of questions related to the same component, like junk fruit, food, there are a lot of questions. Physical activity, few questions related to that, where a person will respond yes or no. Then we put all these responses together and we find out from how many are favorable and how many are not favorable in a linear scale. And in again, Thurston scale is again uh, used in the sociological studies, social studies, where we again go from least favorable concept to the most favorable concept in, in the scale of 10 or 12 and participants rate themselves where exactly they stand and then we analyze it as a scale value okay so i'll be sharing this ppt with you and also some materials related to this uh, so that you can have a look at it later uh, related to these scales because of paucity of time i'm not able to cover on each of these scales more in detail just understand these are the scales available you can explore further on to them on your own as a self directed method of study you need to remember in the rating scales, don't use multiple rating points in the same scale. Do not put both anchors and numbers together. For example, strongly agree, they write, and below that, they write five. Strongly disagree, they write, they write below that zero. Then persons start thinking, should I get zero marks? I will better go for five or four or three. So they get confused with that. So better avoid it. Don't put the anchors as well as rating marks together okay next is do not put uh, uh keep it even points so that it is easy for people to understand it and be careful about negative or unfavorable responses 
how a questionnaire should look like. So I want everyone, especially the postgraduates, please look at this component. So we get the questionnaires where there is no much information available on the questionnaire. Questionnaire list of questions. Respond. The questionnaire should look like this. Looks very simple, right? So it, it looks more or less similar to the questions you questionnaire you design and prescribe. But let me tell you what all things are there. Let us dissect this questionnaire out. There should be a title of your study in your questionnaire. Please remember, you can note it down also. There should be the title of your study. Next. After that, there should be the name of your address. From where you are, who you are, that information should be there. Next. Name of the principal investigator, your guide in case of your PG dissertation or your name. Brief description of your study. What is this study about for which you have come for data collection? A very brief note. They may read or may not read, but it is always good to you to read it in front of them because this is you are taking informed consent, right? So you are using questionnaire as a patient information sheet also. Next, contact information, your phone number, okay, or email ID, both, if it is there, it's very much desirable. Then instructions for each question are a set of questions, how they need to respond to it. Instructions for us answering the questions. Then the body of your questionnaire, which will have all the items together. Open space. As I already made a mention, open space gives you a gold mine information. Then a thank you note, which is very much essential because they are responding to you. They are spending their time to you. You need to really thank them. And then general information, the demography. So the, this demographic information can either be put at the beginning or it can be put at the end also. Some people prefer to put it at the end, but I always feel it. your survey should start, your questionnaire should start with the basic demographic information because it helps in setting the tone, making you more familiar with the participants. This ends the questionnaire designing. I'll take next 10 minutes in validating the questionnaire. The validity is nothing but a measure of your questionnaire's strength. In a very basic sense, validity is the measure of the ability of a questionnaire to check what it is intended to measure. Ability of a questionnaire to measure what it is actually intended to measure. We call it as a validity. Is your questionnaire measuring what it is intended to measure? You want to measure, you know, um, uh, you want to measure, you want to measure depression. Is your questionnaire really measuring depression? Me really measuring suicidal tendency, really measuring anxiety, really measuring academic stress. That is called as validity. Validity can be classified as content validity, criterion validity, and construct validity. Okay. Con we will discuss about each of them in a bit detail. What is this content validity? To what extent the items in questionnaire are relevant. It is as simple as that. I told you to give it to an expert, right? What expert will do? Expert will go through each of the question and they will check whether this is relevant or not, whether it is well-structured or not. Okay. So you can apply each question. Usually what we do is, one of our PhD scholar did it also and many of our students do. So we give a question to the expert and we ask him to rate the relevance of this question from one to five, five being the most relevant, one being the least relevant. And we give this que question to 10 different experts. And we find out among 10 experts, how many of them rated this question as relevant. If it is more than seven have rated this question as 
most relevant that they have given the score between four and five, then we retain this item. We feel that this is the most relevant item. So this is called as content validity. You will be assessing the content, the, the, the relevance of the content of your questionnaire. So we, we give it to the experts and we ask the experts to go through it. It is also called as face validity. Okay. So uh, nowadays people are not very favorable for the word face validity. Now, almost the face validity is replaced by the term content validity. If you say the word content validity, by and large, it refers to the face validity. Okay. Next is criterion validity. Criterion validity is, it is the extent to which scores from questionnaire show similarity to the established criterion using another instrument. So you have all heard of something called as a gold standard. You use, you assess depression using your questionnaire. What is a gold standard in deciding the question? Depression is a clinical examination. To what extent? Your questionnaire results and the results that come out of examination, they coincide. We call it as a criterion validity. So there are two types of criterion validity. One is concurrent validity and other is predictive validity. In concurrent validity, I gave you an example. You assess depression using the questionnaire. And the same person will undergo clinical examination. You check whether your results are matching or not. It is called as concurrent validity. Okay, that is gold standard and this is your screening. And predictive ability is the extent to which this questionnaire will predict the depression. I did this questionnaire and with this questionnaire, the predictive ability of this questionnaire is 80%, 90%. Now we have AI tools, right? AI tools, predictability of AI tool. I was I was just going through one of the projects that was uh, under uh, discussion in our, uh, uh, in our institution. They use this, so, you know, they take a picture of a baby, you know, a newborn baby, and by taking the picture, they will assess the weight of the baby. Okay? So... Picture is your questionnaire. Actually weighing the baby is the gold standard. To what extent the weight that came out of your AI matches with the actual weight that is measured using a weighing scale. That is called, called as predictive ability. To what extent it is predicting the final outcome. So these are two commonly used measures of criterion validity. Criterion validity in very simple word is to what extent the information you got from the questionnaire matches with the gold standard. Okay. Matches with the most prevalent, most commonly used diagnostic measure in that particular period. Construct validity is to what extent all your questions together measure the outcome of your study. It is more or less equal to the predictive ability of the questionnaire and content validity index. So this is construct validity is you have 10 questions, all 10 questions put together to what extent they measure the occurrence of depression. So we call it as construct validity. And there is another thing called as linguistic validity, which is again, a lot of people come and ask whether this questionnaire need to be really translated to the local language or use it. If your end users are comfortable with the local language, you have to translate it. That is most important. If you say, I'm the only person who is collecting the data and I'll ask the same question to everyone, fine. But what is your sample size? 900. Can you ask question? Uh, can you interview 900 persons with your 120 item questionnaire? Difficult. So it is better to translate. Especially when you are using it as a self-administered questionnaire, it is always good to translate. If it is there in English language, give it to a language expert, ask them to translate it into local language. And you have a local language draft one ready. And this local language questionnaire should be back translated to English. Am I making sense? 
number one, you have an English questionnaire. That's, that English questionnaire has to be translated to Kannada. Okay. And this or Hindi or Marathi or Bengali. And this Bengali translated questionnaire should be back translated to English. And then check whether original English questionnaire and back translated English questionnaires are same. What is the level of agreement? Then if the agreement is more than 75 or 80 percent, we call it a SCAPA statistic, then your questionnaire is good to go. You have linguistically validated the questionnaire. To assess reliability, reliability is nothing but the consistency of results. Consistency of results is very important because you need to have your data. If your questionnaire is replicated by many people, the response you get should be same, should be similar. There is something called as inter-rater reliability. I will rate the questions and another person also rate the questions. There should be good agreement between both of us. We call it as inter-rater reliability. Okay, I for question number one, I give four in the level of relevance, I give four. Question two, I give three. The second rater should also give somewhere around four, three or four, five like that. It means that both raters are giving same responses. There is a consistency in responses. Test retest reliability is you conduct the study now, you get some responses. After 15 days, you go to the same individuals and do the same, administer the same questionnaire. And the responses you get today should match with the responses you get after 15 days. We use correlation coefficient. We call a Spearman correlation. This co correlation coefficient R should be more than 0.8. Internal consistency is to what extent each items are consistent with each other. We use something called as Cronbach's alpha. And there is something called a split half reliability where you divide your whole questionnaire into two parts. And you for part one, you do among 10 individuals. Part two, you done, do among 10 individuals. And you take out the results of part one, take out the results of part two, put both of them together. They should match. You call it as a split half reliability. Okay. So with all these things, we will be able to develop a good questionnaire. So... Questionnaires, there are many advantages. They are easy to administer. Collect information from large number of subjects at a short period of time. And they give valuable results in a short period of time. When data has been quantified, when the data has been quantified, it can be used for comparing and contrasting. There are many disadvantages. Number one, designing the questionnaire. You may be feel you might have felt it is easy. Now, listening to this. Don't get demotivated, demoralized. You do it. You do it systematically. You do it in a way which is appealing, in a way which is more scientifically sound. Let it take time. It's a, it's a tedious process, of course, but we need to do it systematically. Validity related issues. The moment you submit a paper, I've used the questionnaire. The first question, that first response that comes from reviewer is, have you, has the questionnaire been validated? If S give the process of validation details. Okay. So valid people should validate the questionnaires. Then only it can be used. At least content validation has to be done. Okay. So that you can tell to the reviewer that the question is validated and you get information from the people. And sometimes there can be lack of uniformity across the scales. Okay? You are using if you are using multiple scales in the exam in the study. Inadequate to understand some forms of information like change of emotions, behavior, using the questionnaires. Though you may say that he was very instant in replying, so he strongly agrees. No, some behaviors, some feelings, emotions cannot be assessed using the questionnaires. And always how truthful the respondent is, is another very important thing. Some, there's something called as a social desirability bias. I sit with another person and we both are answering the question. I always peep to the next person and see what he is responding. And there is a, unfortunately, question as question on, do you do physical exercise? I actually do not do physical exercise, but I look into the other person. He marked yes. Then if I mark as no, 
then I become more inferior. So what I do? I also mark yes. Okay. Sometimes some some people want favorable responses. I go to, I go to the students as a vice principal and say, what is the quality of teaching in my institution? Then students know what answer I am expecting. And they give that answer only. We call it as social desirability bias. So truthfulness and what we call the uh, uh, the person's inner characteristic is very difficult to understand. The, the in uh, credibility of a person's responses is something which is very difficult to understand. How much thought a person has put in while responding to your questionnaire? Okay, whether he has really understood the questionnaire question or not. So you need to be very, you know, you, there is a question whether the person has really understood the question or responded or just responded for the sake of completing it. The respondent may be forgetful or not thinking with the full context of the situation. Okay. Only after a reading all the questionnaire, then the person may realize that, okay, this person questionnaire was related to this. Okay. So they may not have the complete picture at the time of responding because we would have not explained them properly in our patient participant information procedure. And each person may read question in a different manner, in a diff and in a different way of understanding. So that's the reason questionnaire-based studies are difficult. Sometimes researcher imposition. Researcher wants this response. Researcher wants this person to respond. Repeatedly asking him to respond. Then the participant may not give a response which is truth. We started our session with these four objectives to list various tools for data collection. We did it. We described various steps in questionnaire designing, six, seven steps approach. We listed various methods of validating the questionnaire, like face valid, content validity, construct validity, criterion validity. We reflected on various advantages and disadvantages of questionnaire. Okay, with this, I would like to again thank each one of you for being patiently listening to me. I was looking at the numbers initially, it went on up to 260. I was scared with one hour should not drop down to 100s, but it is still in 200s. Thank you very much for being patient listeners. And I would be very happy to take few questions which are pertaining to this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Animesh, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. I'm so happy. I'm so proud. So nice. Okay. So uh, there are a few questions, Praveen. I'll take it uh, Okay, one by one. And then I would expect that you would be able to answer them. So there was a question which says, uh, this is from Bindu KM. Should there be information collected about the subject or just items? We, we have to collect the information about the participant. That's what I told. Initial part of the questionnaire should be related to the demographic characteristic of the participant. That will help us in setting the tone. Suddenly, we go and start asking one, two, three, four, five questions according to our item. Then you will not develop, we will not develop a good kind of a rapport with the participant. Unless that rapport is developed, the participant may not feel, uh, you know, giving, feel like giving the responses. The whole pr process uh, will not be a very uh, pleasant one. So it's always better to take initial information only with the permission from the participants, with the consent. All right. Then there is something about validation. I will take two, three together. So yeah. Dr. Kalan asks, can a standard validated questionnaire be used by the researcher as a schedule? That is one. And in case of like somebody had asked, I've seen that down. So it says about in case of qualitative, is the validation similar or is it different? So that's what I'm just trying to figure out where is that question. So let me see that. Uh, what is the process of validation of a newly designed questionnaire is another question from Dr. Harsh Mahajan. And how do we validate a topic guide that's used for qualitative studies? That is from Dr. Anisa. So these are some of these questions on validation, if you could take them. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir. A newly designed questionnaire need to be validated. So uh, 
the whole idea of validation of the questionnaire is we have to validate so that the answer the responses we are going to get and the quality of information that we are going to get is going to be more valid is going to be more scientifically sound coming to the qualitative aspect typically a qualitative uh, questionnaire schedule question schedule need to be content validated so we cannot go for any other method of validation in qualitative uh, studies it is only and only content validated content validity with limited number with five or six experts who are good in qualitative research and then we can use it okay so there uh, the cronbach alpha inter rater reliability intra rater reliability all those things will not come at all it is only purely the face and content validity so that has to be used i think there was question from harsh mahajan it was related to uh, the pre validated question if it's the questionnaire is pre validated you have all the parameters of uh, validity available in the literature then again there is no need to validate it so it's already the exercise has already been done by somebody so we need not spend time on that we can straight away use it if it suits to our local socio cultural milieu our uh, characteristics sir i think however, i have answered yeah no no yeah however continuing the same since you took up that so there is a question by mamita das who says that can we add one or two new items in an already <laughs> predefined pre validated question and if so what should be done please guide This is a very commonly asked question. Very, very common. So, Sir, would you like to take this? No, no, no. You, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm just moderating. <laughs> If I need, okay, I will fine. pitch in. I will pitch definitely. In. Yeah. I, I definitely need your inputs in this. Yeah. So, a uh, uh, point is. if you are dismantling the questionnaire if you add or remove questionnaire questions from an already existing questionnaire it is nothing but you are dismantling the questionnaire and when you do that it should undergo again uh, uh, another set of uh, it should undergo validation according to uh, the prevalent literature it has to be validated because when we are using the va uh, context validity and the criterion validity all items put together all 11 items put together to what extent it is measuring the construct would have been assessed when you remove these two items then the validity measured will get affected that's the reason we have to revalidate it if you add questions or delete questions it should undergo revalidation then only it becomes suitable for using it in the field for collection of the data so correct as you rightly said and there was another question similar lines so we answered that so manjiri dattar has asked us that manjiri dattar or dattar i don't know how exactly to pronounce dattar so dattar yeah so uh, there is another question can we calculate cvi and cvr for determining content validity any particular method to calculate the same this is from dr nitin ravindran nayar Yeah, uh, Doctor Nitin, we should calculate uh, content validity index for items and content validity index for scales. I think during my presentation itself, I told you how to measure the content validity index for individual items. For example, I have question number one, and that question number one I give to uh, expert number one, and I will tell him, please rate. this the relevance of this question in the scale of 1 to 5 1 being the least relevant 5 being the most relevant he responds as 4 i will give the questionnaire to expert 2 he will rate it as 5 i will give questionnaire to uh, expert 3 he will rate it as 3 so now we have three experts and three different scores we will add all three of them take average this is called as content validity index for item and when we give the whole questionnaire to them and we ask them to rate the relevance of this question on a scale of 1 to 5 it becomes content validity index for the questionnaire okay so these two parameters are different and they need to be measured and they need to be documented in the questionnaire hope i am clear right so pravin uh, i think i will take up another question there are multiple questions on uh, qualitative related issues so somebody has asked what is the process of validation of a, a qualitative uh, questioner then also i am not sure if that is answered i took it up but if there is a, a guide interview guide for qualitative is there a process for that if so what and then somebody is also asking that 
how are we going to do that if it is a qualitative thing so these are some of the things which are like you know what are the different types of qualitative questionnaire and and what's the difference between interview guide and, and a schedule so which you have taken up but uh, you know that, that's again one of the questions so i thought i'll combine these in the interest of time uh, sir as a qualitative i think we should have a separate session on qualitative <laughs> I so know. actually and I it's a passion and it's yeah yeah, yeah initially i told to i want to I told Asha that I want to talk on qualitative research and then she was we'll scared. So it, it cannot time. be done in one hour. So we thought we'll have a pre-conference workshop on qualitative research for IAPSM. So uh, we we, uh, we will go as a team and explain about it. But for the time being, qualitative interview schedule should be face validated. It should undergo only the face or content validation. You give it to the experts, ask them qualitatively to tell to what extent it is relevant. You need not calculate item, you know, uh, uh, content validity index for item, questionnaire, nothing. Ask them to give their opinion in a qualitative way, whether it can be modified. And based on the opinions you get from the experts, you can design, modify your questions. You can do a pilot focus group discussions also to check the validity of your interview schedule. And based on the results of that, you can modify your uh, focus group discussion guide and you can use it. So FGD, uh, qualitative research by and large, is it doesn't uh, fuss into the number. It is beyond numbers. It's only opinion. So I think we should be able to do it. Right. So there was a question from Srisham asking about, you know, negative or positive things. I have answered that in the chat. You have already itself. answered it. Yeah, yes. I've just answered that. So let me see if I have some more open questions. Most of them are appreciating your... Uh, Thank you. There is a, uh, yeah, uh, sir, there is one question from my teacher, Dr. Rekha from BLD. She was my oh, teacher. Sure. She okay. is my teacher. She, uh, she taught yes. me community medicine during my uh, UG sure. time. Uh, hello, Rekha. Ma Thank you very much for joining. Uh, so, Madam wants to know how many subject experts to validate. It is uh, from 6 to 10. 6 to 10 subjects is something that is more desirable for uh, validating the questionnaire. So, we can give it to the people between 6 to 10 experts. Those who actually know the process of validation they give more valid information okay so i that's also answered another question by shrikan similar thing now one more question is now if we use different validated questions or schedules and try to make it one do we need to validate it cumulatively again we have to the answer we, is we yeah have to. because yeah, you have created have a new thing <laughs> yes answer, new thing yeah you made a, and you uh, added you know, <laughs> more confusion <laughs> <laughs> right you, you okay. added more confusion so we have to do uh, it again <laughs> yeah so whether whether new question results has to be compared with the standard if available to be compared for sensitivity analysis by using roc yes it, it has to if you are you really want to be very exhaustive in your validation you can definitely do it especially for the scales. If you want to arrive at a new cutoffs and all, you should go for ROC uh, related thing. Okay, this is analysis. an interesting question. Factor and I'm deliberately, yeah, I'm deliberately taking one question, Praveen. So who can be the experts for content validity? Do we have to take concerned subject experts or community medicine experts? Or they are the only ones who have to be taken community medicine experts? Subject experts. People who know about your construct and people who know about the heartbeat of respondents, how respondents think. Because community medicine experts cannot be experts in everything. We are experts in technicalities. So we are ex we will give you an idea about how to validate it. But the person who is validating should be expert in the area of your study, the construct. Okay. So based on that, you select the experts and they should also have sound knowledge about the process of validation and its seriousness. Then only they'll be, they should be, someone has mentioned, whom do we label as experts? They are the one who should be labeled as experts. Uh, there was one distinct question Dr. Well Murugan Anantan has asked. So he says, principal component analysis has to be done for a new question, a new questioner. Does, does it if, if it really requires, for example, if you are trying to use, uh, if you are trying to measure very subjective construct, 
okay at the, for behavioral components and all there you need to go for principal component analysis but it is not very commonly used for all the uh, studies in very specific conditions where your construct actually demands doing principal content analysis then you can do it N not not for every uh, component and there is a question saying that if we translate do we need to again validate uh, I, I spoke about the linguistic validation. So uh, it has to, the initial language translated, back translated, both of them should match. That reliability coefficient has to come and there should be good correlation coefficient between both of them. So it has to be valid. So, so just taking that forward. Now, many times people use, you know, these available online AI tools as well as Google Translator. What's your opinion on that, Kavin? Sir, Google Translator is terrible. In, I know. That's why I told it goes cognitive, up big time sometimes. Yeah, it, it, they're they're very difficult. People can't understand uh, what Google Translator gives. So that's the reason I told cognitive uh, cognitive interview. Someone was at initial level when I was looking at it. Uh, someone was asking what is cognitive interview. Cognitive interview is basically may, uh, people will understand have to understand the question correctly. So when we do that, then it is called as, then the response we get is valid. Sometimes Google Translator AI tools give something that doesn't match the actual uh, uh, colloquial language, then the responses will not be correct. So it is even, you can use it, you can translate it using the Google Translator, but again, show it to the language expert for God's sake, so that they will give you an idea about whether the translation is correct or not. The translation has to be validated. Okay. So if we are designing, this is from Dr. Somik Ghosh. So if we are designing a scale, can we decide the cutoff on our own? Or is there a procedure to decide cutoff? Like, should we use the median? Uh, I explained about it when I was talking about the concurrent validity and the predictive validity. When you design a scale, uh, you need to parallelly run the gold standard and check the results from your scale and from the gold standard. And exactly as you do the validity analysis for the screening tool, you need to check the sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive value of your uh, scale compared to the gold standard. And if it has satisfactory predictive values, then only you will be able to use it. It has to under. Right. So I think most of the questions we have taken, Praveen, I don't really see any open questions as such. There was one, uh, if no gold standard is available, uh, what can be done? Dr. Whatever Jayashi is the most commonly used method, whatever is the most commonly used method, which may be something that clinicians are already using. If there is no, if, if people are actually practicing it in their uh, regular clinical practice, if that is also not there, then you can decide arbitrarily. There is also a question from Sumit Dash. What is the role of factor analysis, PCA-like techniques in reliability and validity analysis? I think we need to have a completely different session for this, sir. So uh, I, I think we, we can have it as a session in future. So thanks for this question. I think you have given a topic to the IAPSM team for deciding uh, for the future. <laughs> so there are quite a few suggestions also. Uh, so we will take up some of these. In fact, somebody is asking about sample size and all, but we already had a session in November, December. It's archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you could also look at that. But we keep doing that and we will definitely look up to some suggestions that you have. And let me also tell you that this also this whole webinar, the video recording will be available on the IAPSM Karnataka YouTube channel within two to three days. We will endeavor to do it by Sunday, but definitely by Monday we should be able to. What is the difference between expert validation and Delphi panel? Delphi panel is completely different. Expert validation is done on a set of experts on a particular questionnaire. You give it to them and they will rate your question. Delphi is an exhaustive procedure in uh, uh, developing a consensus on various questions. Okay, So for example, I want to do a Delphi on what component should be there as a part of my questionnaire. First, I will roll out roll uh, round one Delphi and ask participants to uh, experts to list the items. And then in second level, I will go for agreement. 
and in third round i will go for the less agreement to uh, items i will give to the experts and i'll ask them to rethink about it it is a multiple process that goes through the subjects who are not there at your place they are widely spread across and they will give you an idea about all that at delphi is completely i i feel for validation delphi should not be used delphi is used for agree agreement level in finding out the items for deciding on your questions go for delphi but validation get it done three dimensional manner or four dimensional manner looking at your experts their expressions their opinions and do it it's it's a Sorry, different issue i'll just take one question more what are all the parameters to be considered to design acceptability questionnaire of particular interventions for example thermography is the screening method for breast cancer mr onkar yadav is asking this sir can uh, can you please repeat this question so what are the parameters to be looked at when you are designing a, a particular acceptability parameters basically or for questionnaire for example like you know you are trying to look at an intervention like thermography in the screening of uh, breast cancer so what are the things that you would look at i i suggest again to go back to the literature and check what all items have been used by others in uh, assessing the acceptability and also go through the focus group discussion with the experts as well as the participants on what determines acceptability of your intervention that act as a base for your designing component and after you design the questionnaire rest of the things are same as i mentioned so when you are designing something new then it is always better to start with the literature and expert consultations that gives the heart of the questionnaire okay since i said but i'll take this last question see this this is about see we talked about back translation somebody is asking why is that required <laughs> back translation is really required because when you translate it into if you try it out sometimes you will realize it you will definitely make it out <laughs> <laughs> it is it, it requires experiential learning uh, sometimes back translated looks completely different from what is uh, original one so a very scary situation occur so if you do back translation you are more confident that your product is same to that of your original copy your xerox copy is similar to the original copy so okay so one, one thing from my side coming to ask so that get your views so now we have ai artificial intelligence and there are there are apps which have ai integrated and i'm sure that you know one of them you also have mou with recently i'm not deliberately naming it because yes. i don't i mean i don't have any interest or the otherwise so there are apps which device or we, which can design questionnaire and they can do a very good job as well right you must have seen it and so what is your view on that can we use them what do you think to design so, a question for a study we can because using the technology is always something that is good it, it it reduces the time effort and everything but we should not use it as a stand alone method of using it always there is you have to we have to put our intellectual component into it i have prepared something using ai straight away i am using it should not be done it should undergo expert validation it should undergo cognitive testing and then only it should be used we should not use something that is taken out straight away from there and and it may uh, subject to the plagiarism also now in many softwares ai is also used to to what extent ai is used in the plagiarism is also assessed okay so considering that i think we should not straight away take something and use it we should again put our intellectual components into it and then do the validation and then only we should be able to use it yeah and just to add that uh see technology is the future so i wouldn't and i'm sure pravin would agree that we can't say no to it i mean going forward that will be but only thing is please remember technology is technology machine is machine we still have to have human intelligence which will validate which will look into it because there is a possibility sometimes that you will not get what you wanted so ultimately it's the human brain which has to see to it and then finally and ultimately technology is only a slave in the hands of humans so we need to see to it that we use it purposefully meaningfully and to the end that we need to i should not say that you know we should not do it otherwise or whatever but definitely use it with caution with a conscience and do it ethically so i think that sums up we've actually exceeded time but yeah i think it's been very, very yeah dr punam 
Yeah, yeah. Good Just uh, on the uh, two points, uh, one with respect to the Delphi technique that somebody had asked. Uh, yeah, so as Dr. Praveen also said, uh, Delphi technique is basically to develop a tool and which goes through a sequence of uh, meetings so as to develop the final product. Uh, just to share an experience uh, in brief, uh, for one of our uh, my PG diploma bioethics projects, we had used modified Delphi technique to develop a curriculum uh, for incorporating ethics into uh, for undergraduate medical curriculum. So where we had a series of uh, modified meetings through a modified Delphi technique. So that is one. So definitely it is uh, not a method of uh, validation of uh, questionnaire or a data tool. Uh, second, with uh, respect uh, to use of uh, AI uh, in development of data collection tools, yes, AI or whatever software that are available, it should be used as an aid. Like uh, we all know when PowerPoint was being introduced, we always used to say it should not uh, replace the teacher or the teacher's knowledge. It should be used as a teaching learning aid. Thereby here also AI should be used as an aid but the researchers acumen uh, should not be isolated completely it should they should go work uh, hand in hand and in it is basically to increase the efficiency of the researchers or to increase the efficiency of the research uh, process that the ai should be used for yeah that's it overall uh, great session dr pravin thank you thank you very much yeah, and, thanks and for thank the opportunity we had, yeah we had almost i think at one time i saw 275 or 276 <laughs> and we've had steady number of 200 plus people Yes. So thank you so much, Praveen. It just yes. shows that you know a lot of people are interested in knowing more about it. And we have been uh, trying to give them the information. So thank you so much. And I also thank uh, IAPSM Karnataka for this opportunity. Of course, thanks to Praveen and Clarnet for giving us this platform, for providing us this you know two-way communication. And, and it's been a wonderful session. So all the best to everybody in your endeavors to do better studies, have better tools and questionnaires and schedules so all the best Take thank care, you very man. much thank you arimesh sir thank you poonam ma'am thank you asha thank you asha for the asha i was asha yes. was very closely working with asha. me on this yes class. yes, yes. And, yes. Uh, thank Definitely. you clonet team <laughs> yeah thank you dr animesh for moderating thank you, thank you dr sir. asha for coordinating and uh, thank you clonet team and yes thanks to dr pravin thank you all thank you thank you thank you so much everyone for extending us the opportunity to host a session so with all your permission, I would like to sign off here and looking forward to host you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.